I was having pain in my glute. Um, I could feel mm-hmm. the pain localized in the glute and then every once in a while it would run into the leg and it would be like an ice pick down the side of my thigh and then my mm-hmm. toes would go numb. But if I bent over, no pain, you know, but then eventually I got to the point where PT didn't really change anything. It, things kept trickling to the way of things are getting worse. Hi, everyone. It's me, CK, the creator and host of the podcast, Bed, Back, and Beyond. Most likely, if you found my podcast, it's because you've injured your back or neck. I herniated a disc in 2019, and I will never forget the physical and emotional trauma that came with that injury. The fear, anxiety, the stress, depression, feelings of loneliness, like I would be stuck and never able to get back to normal life. It was all so real. I scoured the internet looking for stories of successful treatment just to give myself some hope. And that's why I created the Bed Back Beyond podcast. I wanted to give a one-stop shop of positive recovery stories from serious neck or back injury to those of you and me in need. And this is where I would like to ask for your help. If I have been an encouragement to you in any way, would you consider hitting the subscribe or follow button? I would love to get this podcast out there more and in front of the eyes of those who need it. And also, I would love to find people who are willing to share their positive story of recovery from any type of back or neck injury. If you're someone who would like to share your story on the show, head over to bedbackbeyond.com and click share your story. I would love to include you in the show. You're listening to Bed, Back and Beyond sharing positive stories of recovery from serious back or neck injury. Your host is CK, whose greatest accomplishment is getting stuck in a photo booth with Sir Patrick Stewart. On this episode, she's joined by massage therapist and two-time microdisectomy patient, Stephanie Collins. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me on the Bed, Back, and Beyond podcast. Before we uh, jump into your injury, I would love just to learn a little bit about you. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. And very clever name, by the way. I love it. Uh, <laughs> My husband, I did his idea. <laughs> it was so clever when I first spotted it. I was like, oh man, that was a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, my name's Stephanie. Um, I'm 39 years old. Um, I'm a licensed massage therapist, have been for 20 years. Absolutely love my career. I love every aspect, just the the ability to constantly be learning, the the way that you can help people from a natural perspective. And it, it's just a phenomenal career. And I, I've loved every minute of it. Um, I live in Orlando, Florida, um, though I'm not a huge theme park person, but I am a, a warm weather person. Um, I'm engaged. I have an excellent um, partner, Eugene, that's been uh, along the way with me through both of my herniations, and he's been phenomenal, uh, very key part to my my progress and my healing. Um, I like running. Um, I do love exercise. I love traveling, going outdoors, doing hikes. I, I've always lived a really active lifestyle. Uh, anytime people are like, Oh, did you watch this new show or see these movies? I'm usually like, no, I didn't even hear about it. It's just not really, you know, always been a focal point of mine to, you know, uh, be too sedentary. I'm, I'm always up doing something, uh, gardening, trying all that kind of stuff. I try sewing, like I, I'll try anything once, whether I'm good at it or not, that's always a different <laughs> story. But <laughs> so, so what year did you start massage therapy? I started right out of high school. Um, I had gotten a full tuition scholarship to um, one of the best schools in town. I was really fortunate. And then I went, um, I started when I was 18. I was licensed by 19, but I still had um, the advanced program to finish. So I was able to work a little bit while I was finishing up my degree and uh, then I got my license. So I, I've, I've had a good career for sure. Yeah. How long is the training for massage therapy? It really depends. Actually, every state has different restrictions. Um, There are some states and some counties that if you just walk into a courthouse, you can say, I want to be a massage therapist. And they give you a little bit of a license and you don't have to have an education, uh, which the boards are constantly trying to fight that and try to change it to regulate it more, um, which is extremely important. 
Um, in Florida, it's about six months worth of school. You have to hit a certain hour criteria. It's a, roughly around 600 hours. Um, okay. Some places up north are a little bit more um, intense with it, and they kind of say you got to do 1,200 hours. Mm -hmm. um, get licensed by your specific state, and if you were to ever move, you either have to uh, do uh, additional education or you have to kind of show a work history of how many massages that you've provided over the course of your career in order to kind of be grandfathered into their program. Okay. And if you just absolutely love it. I do. I do. I love everything about it. You know, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't get boring. Everybody's, you know, everybody that you have on your table has such a unique uh, body system um, ailment, you know, and there's just so many different ways to kind of, you know, you're, it's a massive thought process to kind of work through what each individual needs and what works for them, whether it be somebody who benefits only from deep tissue, or there are some people who benefit from the lightest touch, mm -hmm. uh, something like a cranial sacral therapy, where you're, you're basically practicing holds along the, the scalp and the spine and the sacral area, kind of just listening to you know, their bodies, wavelengths, and kind of just healing through that. There's, there's just so many opportunities to heal through that, which is fascinating. And it really keeps keeps me going. Is there a particular style of massage therapy that you prefer? I do tend to gravitate to the more active style. So I'm like Eric Dalton, he's a phenomenal massage therapist. He's probably my my massage hero. Uh, so he does a lot of active release, a lot of different stretches, a lot of uh, very detailed work, you know, so say you have a shoulder problem. I mean, there's 30 different ways, different positionings to put somebody in to put, um, you know, put that pain on the sidelines. So that to me is always a, a very effective route. Um, and then recently I had gotten more into craniosacral to kind of see how I would do at more gentle techniques. And I was really blown away at how much that can change a person's life. Wow. Just, just from that light touch. Um, I'm not too much of an energy worker. I tried a couple mm -hmm. Reiki classes and I, mm -hmm. I kind of really get all in on it. Right. Um, it's something with craniosacral. There's so much science behind it still that I got really involved in it very quickly. Um, so all the stretching, all the really nice detailed work, just, you know, whatever, whatever's you're able to feel that muscle response as you work, it, it just, it's so motivating. That's great. So then it was 2015 when your injury started, right? Yes. Yes. And I had no idea that, you know, it started with, <laughs> me waking up one day and, and thinking, Oh, I got to go to the emergency room. They said I had an ovarian cyst. And then after I had that taken care of the pain just kept building. And it was a different pain from what I had first felt when we had realized about the cyst. And, um, I finally went to the doctor. He kept saying, it's just post-surgical pain. It'll go away. And I said, no, I, I know my body, something's, something's not right. So I kind of, luckily I have the type of insurance that I didn't need a referral for mm -hmm. because I knew that they felt really confident in what they felt it was. And I was able to go to an orthopedic and delve further. And I, I, I will never forget me sitting there and I had snuck home with the MRIs, put the disc in myself and looked at it and thought, oh no, that oh. is very <laughs> out of place. Oh. Well, <laughs> so what kind of symptoms were you having? I was having pain in my glute. Um, I could feel mm -hmm. the pain localized in the glute. And then every once in a while, I would run into the leg. And it would be like an ice pick down the side of my thigh. And then my toes would go numb. But if I bent over, no pain. And wow, so really? Yep. That's how they start to figure out if you have a central lateral or, you know, me, where, oh, where okay. direction your herniation goes in they start to certain movements will feel better than others. So I could get through a work day because most of my job is bending, lifting, twisting, all the things they tell you not to do when you have a herniation, right. but you get through the work day. But then by the time I'd get home, I would just be toast. I would just need to lay down, relax, throw an ice pack on and 
that's when I got most of my TV in <laughs> during, <laughs> during that healing process. Right. Um, and then once, uh, as I got closer, I was able to plan that surgery out, uh, which was very lucky because I could shop around for doctors. I tried physical mm-hmm. therapy beforehand. They ended up telling me, don't, don't try the injection. We're not going to do that. You're past that point. This is too large of a herniation. We know it's not going to work. Okay. Um, And at the time they even had said, well, we've given you a steroid pack. If that didn't make a difference, then the shot won't either because it's the same exact medicine. Okay. And I thought, okay, they they know what I'm talking about. So I'll I'll skip past that point. The, the idea that, you know, I could, I could get through a day, you know, but then eventually I got to the point where PT didn't really change anything. It, things kept trickling to the way of things are getting worse. How and long did I you find, physical therapy? I did a whole eight week session, mm-hmm. uh, eight, eight weeks worth. Right. And it was a lot of balancing exercises, kind of those basu balls. They'd have me stand on, they'd have me do the oh. resistant bands. Um, they'd have me do the bridges. They'd have me do the Superman pose. Um, nothing that was too unusual or out of the scope of what I was doing pre, uh, injury. And, you know, I ran, I did half marathons, you know, I, I really didn't expect this to be, I would, if anything with my life, I would have thought it, my knee's probably going to have a, an issue more than my back I wasn't right. thinking about it. Um, so once I got to the point where I can't get out of my car to get my own gas, mm-hmm. and that was, I, I literally called the neurosurgeon from the gas station because that was my breaking point where I just sat there and my body wasn't communicating well after a day of work of, okay, move your leg, get out of the car. And the pain was just so severe mm-hmm. that I, what am I doing? You know, if if this has a solution, a fix for it, why am I not doing it? You know, and at the time I'm 31. And so you're looking at it as I I could have two weeks left on this earth. I could have 30 years, you know, why, why suffer if there's an option? Right. Which disc was herniated? That one was L5S1. Okay. And I do think, I I feel like my age group, we all had parents that had back problems. Oh, yeah. (laughs) During the the eighties and the nineties, back surgery had a really bad reputation. Mm-hmm. And things are so advanced now. Yeah, I read an article the other day that they're now doing fusions with people awake to oh. make sure that they are doing everything right, that they're communicating with the person, and all of this. And they were saying how much um, uh, faster recovery they can. Uh, gain out of it without the anesthesia and all of these benefits. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I could mentally. (laughs) I don't don't think so either. Okay with that. (laughs) But I love where we're going with this. (laughs) I love that you mentioned the generation though, because uh, at the time of my herniation, my husband's a pastor. So we were at that time in a church of 600 people. So I herniated my disc. And any older person, elderly person who came up to me, they all pretty much said the same thing. I'll never let a doctor open up my back. Yes. <laughs> I don't, you're, you're stressing me out even more, you know, <laughs> the older generation mentality of, you know, back surgeries are terrible, but they've and, advanced so much. They they really have. And I, and I really do feel that one person had a bad experience and it trickled down that game of telephone to where it just struck fear in so many people. Definitely. And I think just the simple fact that you did this surgery and you go home same day within an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. I mean that they have to have science behind that. They can't just do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so it's, and everybody says, well, you, you had made your surgery. And I think, did I though? Mm-hmm. You know, Yes, I had a major uh, structural part of my body operated on, but there's a part of me that feels that this is kind of getting to the point where it's routine because it, it you can just drive up. You don't have to spend the night or anything. You just you, you get up and you go home and then it's up to you. Mm-hmm. 
So, so it, it sounds like your surgery experience was was pretty easy. It was um, the first time, especially, you know, I went in so ready and I remember waking up and immediately I just knew that it worked, you know, just all that pain that I had. And just, you know, when you're holding pain for so long, everything in your body is reacting to it. Everything right. tenses up. You're holding yourself so tight. You're constantly bracing. You're constantly just in that state of, I have to protect uh, everything in my system right now. And when I woke up, yes, of course you're medicated, but you could just feel it. I could feel the function of the systems work or the blood flow in my leg and just everything about it was just at ease. And I remember uh, once I got up, I said, well, let me walk. And the nurse said, well, give us a few more minutes. I said, no, no, I really, I really want to. <laughs> and they had a, the first time it was actually at a, a true hospital and mm -hmm. they had a little PT room on there and they had this little step stool. And I said, can I try it? And they said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I was in there doing the little steps and everything. And, it, you know, when I got home, I think I took the medication they prescribed me for about three days mm -hmm. and then eased off of it because I thought, I, I don't think I really need this. And wow. sure enough, I didn't, you know, the incision was uncomfortable, sure. um, but only when you laid on it and probably for two minutes, you'd think it was, it's kind of like the princess in the pea, you know, your, your back is swollen to the point where you lay on it and you're thinking, Ooh, something's there. But mm -hmm. you can't really do anything about it. And you just got to let go and sink into it a little bit. Right. So how long did you um, have to wait before you went back to working as doing massage therapy? Three months. So, wow. so it's because my job is technically physical where there is all the actions they start to train you never to do the, the twisting, the bending and the lifting. Um, they said, well, you need to wait the three months because we want to make sure that that scar tissue has completely, uh, scarred over and mm -hmm. really contain the area and really get all your strength back. Because when you have a desk job, you know, you're able to sit and maintain your posture, which is great for strengthening the, the postural muscles still. But for me, I'm constantly still moving them. So if I did it too soon within a weakened state, then I would be at risk for a re herniation or not healing as positively as it did. And how did you do then emotionally with having to miss three months of work? Um, you know, you have that that joy of the pain being gone, but the healing process in itself is kind of, of a difficult time. Yes, it was tough. Um, luckily, my coworkers are excellent and everybody kept in touch with me and let me know what was going on. And I have so many books and even massage DVDs. I'd throw those on and, you know, use it as an opportunity to, to keep learning and, and yeah. kind of figure out more stuff. Um, so I, I do feel that it was tough to not go back to work because you're missing that socialization. You're missing just that routine even. Um, mm -hmm. So you start to sleep in a little bit more, or go to bed earlier, or, you know, you just kind of get out of that practice. And then to yeah. try to retrain when you go back to work is a little bit tough. Yeah. Um, but I definitely tried to fill it with as much uh, positive things as I could activity wise use it as an opportunity, like, oh, remember those shows that I promised so-and-so that I would watch, I'll watch it now. <laughs> or <laughs> you know, that book I bought that I swore I would read and I never found the time to, you know, yeah. and just walking, doing a lot of walking. Yeah. Um, just keeping it moving. That's a great mindset. Like this is an opportunity, you know, nowadays I'll say I could use another month of lockdown just to have to be home and focus on stuff. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's true. And, you know, I remember early on one of the first things somebody said to me for, from this herniation, which was a lot more extreme than my first one said, Oh, well, enjoy your time off work. And it crushed me because I thought, Nobody wants this. Nobody, yeah. even, the, even somebody who complains about their job nonstop, if you're forced to leave it yeah. and it's not on your own free will, that still takes a toll. 
Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's not the right thing to say. No. <laughs> Someone asked me if I enjoyed my vacation. Yes, exactly. What? <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, that's not my idea of a vacation. I don't know what yours <laughs> is. <laughs> oh, so then, so now you have a second herniation happened. Was that the beginning of this year? It was um, around... March, I started to feel a little bit different. I kind of thought, huh, my left is really kind of in a spasm. And usually my right is the one that flares up because my mm -hmm. first herniation L5S1 was more on the right side. And then now, um, and at the time we knew L4, L5 was bulging, but they will not do surgery unless it is causing no problem because- mm -hmm. Once they do that, uh, it will create more instability. And if it's too soon to do it, you know, why? Mm -hmm. So they left it alone. And then eight years later, and, and I honestly did not expect it to be a herniation. Um, I could tell my muscles were guarding something, but I, I went until July being really normal still. I could still work. I went on a vacation. I walked a ton throughout um, the city. And I just, you know, nothing was too off except for I was taking some muscle relaxers a little bit more often. And then the week of like July 12th, things got pretty rough. And I thought, okay. So I started calling my doctors and saying, and now I had gone to two doctors and they did the straight leg test. They did all the stuff mm -hmm. they normally do to test if it's your back. And they said, no, nah, yeah, you, you just need a muscle relaxer. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll try it. And I did my acupuncture and I did my self massage and all my, my gadgets for self care and everything. And nothing was, it would give me maybe 10, 15 minutes of relief. And then it would just be back. And I thought, all right, I gotta, I gotta keep digging here. Yeah. Um, so by the time I went to the hospital, the emergency room, I thought it was organ failure because oh. I, could not use the restroom. And wow. I knew I had to, but it just, nothing was happening. And so I thought, okay, suddenly I must have a kidney issue or something. We, we better go. Mm -hmm. So by the time I get there, uh, I was like full body chattering, just like shaking. And the doctor says, Oh, that's your nervous system. It doesn't know what to do with all the pain. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I had recently had a um, ultrasound um, for, you know, ovaries and everything. And they said, everything's fine. But they said, let's get you in, check your bladder. And I was holding so much fluid in. And they said, if you don't get it out, we're going to have to give you a catheter. Mm -hmm. and, but everything looks fine. We just don't know why you're withholding it. So eventually, a few hours later, they said, we're going to have to admit you because nothing's changing. You know, they were giving me the morphine and everything and that I was in exactly the same uh, pain level as when I got there. So they put me in the uh, MRI. And then within an hour, they said, you have a massively herniated disc. We have to do emergency surgery on you. Yeah. Oh, wow. And of course, I'm shocked. Uh-huh. I'm emotional at that point because I'm thinking, I don't know any of you people. I don't know. I haven't read the reviews. I haven't read up about this. Like right. you haven't even shown me a picture of your, of, of my own MRI and you're telling me you're going to cut me open later today. Right. So um, I said, well, I, I need to meet this doctor. And she says to me, well, I had not from him, but I had surgery from somebody in his office, but his office isn't there anymore. But in ever and I'm fine. I'm fine. Look at me. I'm like, that's great. Gee, thanks. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, but I need I need to make some decisions on my own right now. Um, so when I met him, he was really standoffish, not really wanting to look me in the eye, even Ugh. and said, I can't do this. Right. You know, I, you I have to be comfortable with your doctor. You have to be comfortable with them. Absolutely. And seeing as how I had a positive experience in the past, um, I wanted to go back to them, obviously. And when I called them, the after hours was a, a little, little uh, aggressive about you're no longer a patient. It's been eight years yeah. and we haven't seen you. If they're telling you emergency surgery, get the emergency surgery. 
And I thought, it just doesn't feel right. And I said, well, you at least need to transfer me to where there's a neurosurgeon to, and I want a second opinion. Right. And I remember asking the, the doctor, I think his title is technically hospitalist. And I said, can, can I at least go home? I'm, I'm a little more stable now. By then they had started the steroids and the steroids were like my number one medication. I mean, that when I went off of that, I knew it, I could feel a massive difference in my pain level. Okay. Um, and he looked at me and he just slowly shook his head and he said, I can't. And my, I just can't, I just can't let you go. It, it's too, it's too delicate. And I said, uh, okay. So they transferred me um, to the larger hospital in town that has the neurosurgeons and a, a more specific back wing. Mm-hmm. And they came in at one in the morning, the, the PAs and said, we're looking at you, your age, your weight, your health, everything is so good. We, we really think we can do this without the surgery. And I think this is a massive change, you know, but this is neurosurgery, you know, okay. You know, and plus they're kind of telling me what I want to (laughs) hear. So I I agreed and I followed up with their office. I I tried the injection. Uh, Okay. I did not, it didn't do what I wanted it to do for sure. Yeah. Um, I felt pretty good for a couple days and then it just kind of kept creeping back up and they offered to do another one because they said, well, we might've gone a little too left for you. Okay. We can try a more central injection. And I said, I am having to take medication to use the restroom properly. I right. said, my concern is if I continue this way and I let that compression on that particular nerve go for longer, mm-hmm. am I going to be 40 years old in a diaper? If say I leave here and I get rear ended or I fall, or if something else happens, how much risk is there? And she just kind of looked at me. She's like, I mean, yeah, it's a possibility. And I said, okay, well then I don't know if I want another shot. I think I want to take the next step and, and do the surgery because, you know, there's, there's a large amount of fortunate people who say I have a herniation, but it, it reabsorbed. Mm -hmm. Not that lucky. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And where they were somewhat convinced that the steroid shot would shrink it and and calcify and this and that, and I'd be fine. I just felt, I don't have this much more time to waste. You know, right. the mental toll that that level of pain creates, uh, quality of life, just the, the muscle loss, um, you know, everything about it that goes into it. To me, when there is a solution out there that, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a great positive experience the first time. Right. And I felt really confident the second time around would be exactly the same. Um, so I, I wanted to skip ahead. Mm-hmm. They were a little offended um, <laughs> and kind of questioned me and thought, uh-huh. I thought, look, guys, like, I, I just can't any more time. I can't feel like this for much longer, you know, because right. it's not worth it, especially to prolong damage to my body for my future. Right. right. It just doesn't, it doesn't add up. Right. I often say like when people ask, should I get the surgery or should I, you know, try physical therapy for months and months? I always say it's up to you, but you have to do a cost analysis of time. Are you able to wait eight months to see if you're starting to feel better or do you not have that option like financially or whatever the, the reasonings are? Yeah. Yeah, Financially, the the mental aspect of it, depending on your support group. If you have Mm -hmm. people around you, um, you know, I feel like that's something that I see a lot of is I'm in pain and, you know, I know my partner is going to leave me or, you know, I'm going to be alone and I don't know what to do. And just, I think there's so many aspects that go into it that people don't really think about, you know, a lot of people, they think about pain and they think, oh yeah, just take a Tylenol. You know, this is, this is next level stuff where you don't know if you're going to be able to move your leg, you know, within your next step. And, um, it, it's just, 
it is tough because you have to be able to weigh things out and you got to think about your future and, and what's going on inside of you while you, you kind of wait. And, you know, I, I definitely respect everybody for trying everything. And I know that I did too, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm in a field of natural healing right. and I love it. I adore it. I believe in it, but there are certain scenarios where that just won't be your answer. Yeah. And it's a very personal decision to decide, you know, I, I can't keep doing this. And and if you can keep doing it, like, okay, but, you know, just try, try to keep everything in line and just know what your limit is and be able to, to say it. Mm-hmm. And did your second surgery go as smoothly as your first then? It did. It did. Luckily, I, it, this was a very much a different ball game. So there has been a couple quirks afterwards, but mm-hmm. compared to where I, I was, I will always still say this is a complete success because I'm not on any medications. I was on probably four or five different medications um, every six to eight hours. I mean, I had a spreadsheet <laughs> so I could mark <laughs> down to make sure I didn't take too much. And I took it on time to stay ahead of the pain. Um, but th- this time I had gone July, August, like two and a half months, not being very mobile. Mm-hmm. So I dropped 15 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost a lot of my muscle. I, I you know, yeah. there was, so I went into it weaker than I would have liked to have. Yeah. Um, PT, I would take two days to recover from. And, and as I had told the PT, I'm like, these are baby exercises. And I'm so frustrated that I can't, Mm -hmm. you know, if if I laid down in bed to, and needed wrong and needed to adjust, I I couldn't even bridge to get myself comfortable Mm -hmm. because it was that bad. Wow. Um, but I mean, immediately after surgery, I, I knew it worked within a couple of days. I was like, oh my gosh, yes. Like we, we, I made the right choice. We we're mm-hmm. getting there. We're making some real progress. Um, and then, you know, and I see this a lot where a couple of weeks into it, all of a sudden a, a different pain shows up and yeah. I definitely had that, you know, and I kind of had my I had all the emails from my doctor office and everything with all these questions of, yeah. is this normal? Is this normal? I, I know I did this eight years ago, but I can't really remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, if I did a search in the, in the Reddit group, the microdisectomy is it normal? Yes. Probably come up with like hundreds. <laughs> is this normal? So yes. many weird things just happen. It does. The body's an amazing thing, and yeah. you never know how it's going to present any number of anything. Um, yeah. it's, it's fascinating, but, um, it, it took me a couple weeks of, well, I would say three, four days, the pain on my left side was, was pretty much gone. And, you know, you could feel little zings and zaps from the nerves, but not near as frequent because it was, it was constant, mm-hmm. um, prior. I mean, I, I didn't get a minute's rest. Um, and then the right side started to flare up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, oh, okay, it's probably because I'm kind of baby in that side. And and that around week seven, I would say, instead of that right hip pain that would come every night, it, it it's coming like once or twice a week. So it's filtered itself out as mm-hmm. the, the more I get stronger and the more I'm going through PT and the, the physical therapists kind of joke with me a little bit because they they say we know we don't have to really pay that much attention to you. You're you're putting the work in, and mm-hmm. I said, well, I still want you to pay attention and make sure I'm doing it all right. right exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but PT is is really essential, and I see a lot of people say, oh, I, I went two times and that was it, and I thought, oh. And some and, doctors don't even prescribe it, and I'm just like, why? They were, they were a lifesaver for me emotionally just to have. Yeah. Therapy. Yes. And I don't understand why mm-hmm. it wouldn't be part of the program. And I did see a lot of people say, oh, my doctor's having me start at two weeks or four weeks. And I had to be six. Mm-hmm. And so I, on my six week follow-up, I, I confronted my doctor about it. And I said, how come other people are getting to start this <laughs> earlier? Mm-hmm. Cause I started to get a little left out feeling. 
And he said, well, scientifically at six weeks, that's when everything is really scarred over. And he said, some people are really aggressive about starting it early. And he said, but the, hit most of his cases, he says, wait the six months right. or the six weeks, sorry. Mm -hmm. So maybe that has to do with what kind of job somebody is going back to right. um, right. and just kind of generally what they saw in there too. Yeah. So I absolutely love your website. You um, do a great detailed walkthrough of just all your experiences. So if you could just talk a little bit about your where they can find you on the internet. Yes, thank you. Um, so the serene spine, uh, dot com, and I'm also on Instagram. Basically, my my goal is to help direct people into the right products. Uh, there's mm -hmm. so many things out there in the world now that when you go to Google something, there's 50 different options for, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that can get very confusing, especially when you're already going through what you're going through. And mm -hmm. so my goal was, why not share that knowledge? You know, I've tried everything. So to kind of share that with people, I think is very important. I know I like to read reviews and it helps me make decisions on making purchases. Mm -hmm. So when it comes down to it, having somebody have that personalized experience, I think is helpful to pick out the right product for you. And not everything's going to work for everybody, but there are certain things that I think are pretty universal. Mm -hmm. um, but additionally, I just think that it's nice to be able to put that out there for people um, that can properly relate to that particular need mm -hmm. and that structure of their life because you you do restructure a lot of things after a, a herniation after the surgery you do start to look at things in a different way of do I really need to bend all the time or should I just always use the grabber or you know, there's certain little things that you can constantly edit throughout your life to kind of prolong that function. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many things where people say, you know, I just simply bent down to get my shoe on and I felt my back go and right. go into a spasm. And there are little reliable tools that help you make those motions easier, more ergonomic, more functional to kind of help prevent that, you mm -hmm. know, and it, it's not really about, um, you know, babying yourself so much as it is just, you know, wisely taking care of yourself in ways right. that, that can help and just prolong or limit that pain response that your body's having. Mm -hmm. And you also do a great uh, detailed timeline of your two experiences. Yes. I think it's so helpful for people just to see, to see what you went through and what, what worked, what didn't work. Yes. Huge thank help. You. Yeah. And, and I think for a lot of people too, it, it's almost, it can, it can be a lifelong thing where it took 10 years for that herniation to really be symptomatic. And then the, for some people, it, it's a matter of weeks, just yeah. how quickly. And I think it's kind of comforting to, to see other stories like that to relate to, because I know for me, I sat there in that hospital room thinking, what did I do wrong? What mm -hmm. could I have done differently to prevent this to, you know, like what happened, you know, but then I think about it and I think I was still running. I, I went for a couple runs within the last month and I did this other right. fitness right. class and, you know, I, I'm not an unhealthy person. I am putting the effort in, <laughs> you know, but just some yeah. things are genetically unavoidable, you know, mm -hmm. and that's when the doctor said to me, he was like, you know, this this is genetic. This is just kind of how things play out. You know, you can't really fight everything back with a healthy diet and this and that. And I mean, I think there's a lot to say about that. There, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Um, but I just think that when things happen, it, it's nice to have that, that camaraderie to where you can yeah. find somebody that understands and it's kind of on that same platform as you to where you have a support system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important. <laughs> yeah, so important to have support. Uh, yes. And are you back to doing massages now? Not yet. So my yes, um, okay. surgery was September 25th. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to work since July. Um, because once I was in the hospital, things kind of kept 
you know, at first I told them, I'll come back after my injection. It, it takes 10 days after the injection to hit its full capacity of effectiveness. And so I'll, I'll be back. And then halfway through, I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to be back. <laughs> um, so so changing the paperwork w- w- was a chore. Um, yeah. But just kind of I, I figured out how to be OK with it. You know, yeah. and that's kind of a lot. And now that I am feeling better, mm-hmm. you know, I have a couple little restrictions and things I haven't quite gone out and done yet. But it, it is a little bit easier to cope with now that mm-hmm. I, I at least go outside and enjoy something. Right. Uh, but I'll we'll go back to the start of the year and they're going to structure it to where it's light duty. Um, and I'll probably start doing about three massages a day, maybe an hour break in between, and then just kind of ramp up strength again. Okay. Well, I hope that you continue to heal well um, and that you can get back to your clients. It sounds like you have lots of people waiting for you. <laughs> yes. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. So your website again was the serene spine.com. Yes. And uh, it's the same on Instagram, except for it's the period serene dot spine. Okay, great. Stephanie, yeah. thank you so much for being willing just to take the time during your healing recovery time right now to share your story with us. Um, I appreciate people like you on the Reddit community that are just commenting, encouraging, and answering questions. It's exactly what people in our situation need. I agree. And thank you so much for facilitating it all. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. If you are a listener and you have a positive story of recovery from a serious neck or back injury that you would like to share, then head over to bedbackbeyond.com and click share your story. And if you're looking for somebody's positive story, head to theserenespine.com and read Stephanie's story. And good luck to you and your recovering. Thank you again, Stephanie.